clarity, there yeah. wasn't violence in your marriage? No. What but there was allegations of violence. From, from the period where I think even before we got divorced, where I was like, I'm dealing with this and I'm young and I'm not understanding it. As soon as I arrived, not even 10 minutes later, the police come. They're like, Mr. Masha, there's a protection order. You have to leave the house. Mr. Masha, are you well? I'm very well in yourself. I'm, yeah. I'm fantastic. Yeah. Um, I get into a lot of trouble for, from some of my, my my community. So we call them engineers. Yes. Uh, because apparently I don't greet. I just get straight into the conversation. Yeah. So, um, and how are you? How's your heart? Oh, my heart is good, man. Yeah. You know, my heart is full right now. I'm good. How are you? I'm fantastic. Yeah. Um, she's been doing a lot of these. It's been a long year. Yeah. Uh, I won't lie. I'd say I'm tired, feeling a bit of fatigue. Okay. Yeah. But growing the platform, spreading the positive conversations has, has been fulfilling. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think you're doing a fantastic job, by the way. It's not about me today, though. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not. It's, about, I it's about never about me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, does a person like you, whom um, rightfully can be called a legend in the space, especially mm -hmm. in acting, do they look to other legends in other areas of the world and, mm -hmm. and draw from them? Always, you know. And, and, you know, that term legend is such a, such a big term. It's almost like now you can't make any mistakes. You, you kind of always have to be on point. And I guess that's the nature of the business anyway. Mm -hmm. I mean, even before I was termed a legend, I think it comes from just having that long longevity and that uh, persistence and sticking around in the industry but I think one in an industry like ours can learn from everybody and should always have an open mind to learn from people before you that came and the people that are coming behind you that have just entered the business you know um, if you have that constantly open mind to learn you always do well do, is there a name are there a few names that immediately come to mind where you're like I followed this person's journey for very long and I'm just amazed at how they continue mm. to, 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 mm. to, to, to carry themselves mm. in the career, even yeah. with their mistakes, because yeah. there's beauty in mistakes. Yeah. So is there a name that comes to mind? Yeah, quite a couple. You know, yeah. um, someone that I, I, I really am very fond of, I, I even say I love very much, is John Gano. Okay. I think that he is a legend like proper. You know, that, that, that man, that Tata, was, was doing work like in the 70s international level you know he, he won a tony i think in 1980 and every time we get together and i remember the first time working with him he was so open and loving and giving um he doesn't come across as someone who you're just working with but he comes across as someone who's definitely a father figure wow and i always appreciate people like that who were here yes we're at work but my age is, I am your father, and it's a I factor. will behave in that yeah, way, in, yeah, that, yeah. in that loving, that open, that welcoming way. I, I really enjoy working with him every time I, I get a chance to be with him. I'm more about um, the man he is, you know, and trying to emulate that. I mean, he's a family man. Um, he's been married to his wife for so many years. He's raised amazing children, and he continues to do amazing work. And he doesn't come with any of those airs and graces, you know. He's just like, call me Doc. That's the only thing. Yeah, like, call me yeah, Doc. But he's, yeah, just, he's yeah. so lovely. And another person that I really admire very much is someone like uh, Silomake Kanube. Okay. Um, he's such a cool hrot man, you know. And he always has been. Like, even at the height of the generation's hype, you know. He was the kind of guy. Archie was, hype. <laughs> yeah, the Archie hype. He's just the kind of guy who was like easygoing. He was like, I'm just a bra, you know. Let's just, let's just talk. But... I'm mentioning only two, and I could go on and on. The list just keeps going. That they Jerry Mufo gang. Um, I'm mentioning a lot of guys. So I'm just trying to remember Abu Mama, like, um, and and also all the all the ladies who are like they bring that very maternal spirit onto set. You know, and that, that's always amazing. For the purpose of growth, I'll draw these parallels because, um, and we don't 
there's absolutely no reason to enter into the details of what's out there but in, we must learn mm. from the parallels that I'm about to draw. That uh, John Gani is a legend because he's a father figure. Mm. You say you enjoy how he conducts himself with his family, um, how he's maintained his marriage and the longevity of that, um, and the acting, the work, and yeah. how he takes it professionally and seriously, um, and the business of the acting. Yeah. Yeah. You've got the same with Ndate Silo, who's a great actor, who's done well, who's accumulated a lot, who has an international name, but he doesn't have the most perfect family life. Why is it important to see the various people and see how you can overcome whether it looks all rosy or yeah. it looks like it's muddy? Yeah. Because as you get older, you realize that, you know, life is not as black and white as you think. Life is actually just, I suppose, a palette of gray. Okay. You know, from very sure. dark gray to yeah. very light gray. Yeah, yeah. But you have to accept people for who they are and also understand that how I might perceive in terms of uh, societal perception of what is a perfect life doesn't always seem that way and what I might perceive not to be perfect might actually be that. Mm -hmm. And I think we all come with a smorgasbord of experiences that make us who we are. And you have to judge people at face value. You know, I talk about, you know, Brasillo as someone who is a very loving man, you know, um, but maybe he just hasn't been that fortunate in that part of, of, of like family life in the, in the classical normative sense. Um, but that doesn't take away from how amazing an individual he is and sure. how much integrity he actually has. Sure. Hey family, thank you so much for being loyal to Engineering Your Life. I know that if you're watching this, you're probably here for the second time or the third time. And please, if you're here for the second, third time, please may you kindly subscribe. Because if you subscribe, it helps us to get better conversation, get better guests, and get access to creating the best content that we can for you. So please don't forget to subscribe and make sure you continue watching this episode. I knew what I wanted to do. I didn't know I'd be here with okay. it. I mean, I, I feel like I've known this is what I wanted to do from a very early age, probably as young as four. I just knew that I wanted to be in entertainment. I wanted to be an entertainer. I think what was difficult in my time for grade 12 students, we didn't have the internet for one. Okay. Um, and it was hard to navigate a path. I think it was just m more challenging to navigate the path that you see before you because the biggest challenge for me in grade 12 was where am I going to study this? You know, it wasn't like I could just go on Google and see if Vitz offers a course, if there's an AFTA and all that. It was more like very old school type of way of searching. So I think young people now, if I can say this, you do have it slightly easier in that regard. But where you have it more challenging is there's too many choices now, mm, right? Mm, mm. So, and, and I think it's a challenge, but it's not a bad challenge. It's, it's a good challenge. And every generation has their own challenges. I would say to young people, the way to figure out probably what you're supposed to be is start with what do you really love? What could you do hmm. every day, all day, 24-7, and you would be willing to pay for it? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, you, you, would be with, yeah, you would be willing you, to pay for it. You. That's probably a direction that you should probably take because what I've learned over the years is to sustain a career, it takes a lot of passion. Hmm. It takes being able to be tenacious and at times when things aren't going your way to stick it out because, and I always say this to young people when, they, when, they, when, when I'm working with them, like you're going to get a lot of no's. Like that's the nature of our business. You're going to get rejected a lot. But don't worry about that because you're going to have so many no's until you get to your yes. Go mm. through the no's, get your yes. And even if right now you might feel like Everyone's telling you you're not right for this. You're not right for this. You're, you're, you're the wrong color. Um, you're the wrong complexion. You're the wrong height. You're the wrong build. Um, you're the wrong gender. All of those things. There will come a day when you'll be just right. So just hang in there. Why must I hang on when I'm constantly being told I'm not right for what I believe is mine? Because you're saying to me, if I connect to my passion and I connect to my purpose, then I thought I'm in the right track. Yeah. But here again, you're saying I'll get a lot of no's. So how do I not lose track that these no's are actually a signal that I must try something else, be an accountant? Well, because I think to get to your destiny, it's never a straight road. Okay. And that's something that I think a lot of parents don't tell their kids. 
because I think we as parents also are a bit anxious. You know, we're watching you guys growing up and you're now, you know, you've had this passion your whole life. You start, you, you're about to be 25 and, and things really haven't happened for you, you know, and we're worried. Uh, is this going to happen? You're worried. The people around you are worried. But I think what we should do more as parents, especially black parents, I'd say, is have faith in the process because not everything happens at the time that we think it should happen, but it happens at the right time. Hmm. So I'll take my own life, for example. You know, I started out, went to Vitz Drama School. Um, by my second year, I was already, I'd say, kind of working, but I was auditioning a lot. And I was wrong for, I was told that I was wrong for so many parts until I got the part that I was right for. And if I can use that to say, if I had given up before then, I wouldn't have gotten to where I am today. Correct, because you wouldn't have started. Yeah, right? Yeah, but I, but yeah. I had to get through that. And, and I'll say, by all means, have a plan B in terms of how do you take care of yourself okay. while your destiny is, is, is unfolding, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. while you're pushing the passion. Mm -hmm. um, so, so find something else that you can do. I mean, when I was starting out in my early 20s, we did everything that we could, you know, we be waiters uh, and waitresses at restaurants. Um, I was a promo guy, mm -hmm. you know. What did you uh, promote? I uh, pro Valpre. <laughs> my favorite story is Valpre had come out, you know. Yeah, it was yeah. a new brand. Yes, yes. And my nephews always say, like, you were there when Valpre came out? I was like, yeah, I was there. So I was like early 20s and I was young and fit. And it, it was awkward because, you know, I think, we weren't as protected as we are now and it was like you have to go to these restaurants and be topless and hand out this water and it was like it's a gig dude you know that's what we're doing yeah yeah. um yeah. and i did it uh, i i've handed out pamphlets on the side of the road hmm. that lasted about three hours because <laughs> i was like this is my working for me i've done jobs in, you know before online um marketing and, mm -hmm. and being able to buy things online um it was like a mini team move, if you will. You. you know, we'd go you. around with these massive bags over our shoulders in downtown Joburg and go from business to business, like selling. corporate to corporate, selling, opening yeah. our bag and saying, hey, guys, today I've got these. Sure. Would you like to buy these toys for your kids and, you know, this and that and blah, blah, blah. And I've done, um, I was a call center agent back in the day when we still had the yellow pages. So they give you like a list from M in the yellow pages to M E, let's say, or That's M half the I. Country. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, don't do the M's. Yes. <laughs> uh, you just call people, and I remember like it was the weirdest thing because we'd start work in the in the late afternoon, so sure. calling people when they get home on their landlines. So back then there was no call ID, mm -hmm. right? Um, and as much as you think we we hate people cold calling now, back then people are about to have dinner, the phone rings. And you pick it up thinking maybe it's a, a relative or a friend and it's this guy trying to sell you something arbitrary. Mm. And there was a lot of phones getting dropped on you, being sworn at and all that sort of thing. But that yeah. also taught me like part tenacity. Of the it was yeah. part of the process. Yeah, 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 definitely. And that's how I made some cash while I was working towards this dream. Do you remember your first yes? Oh, yeah. I remember my first yes. It was amazing. And it was, it was very nerve-wracking. Um, I was still in drama school, so I went to Vitz, you know, and at the time, Vitz was very prestigious in terms of drama. It was sure. very theatrical. We were being taught to be thespians in the, in the line of doing Shakespearean work or protest theater, and I, that's where I saw myself. I saw myself as a very serious thespian who was going to go into theater and hopefully earn a living from that. Mm -hmm. And then I went for this commercial, and it was Lion Lager was rebranding mm -hmm. at the time. And they wanted to make it younger, more urban, more funky, and more cool. And I got this gig, man. And at the time, commercials used to pay well. I mean, you could literally get one commercial and not have to work for the rest of the year. Or you could My buy goodness. your first house wow. with a commercial back then. And I got this commercial, and the money was good. And I had this moment of, like, am I selling out? you know, um, because I'm doing a commercial as opposed to I'm um, doing serious theater. Mm -hmm. And I just said to myself, dude, um, it's a job, you know, and it's part of what you've always wanted to do. Go do it. And I embraced it. And once I embraced it, it was amazing. I 
it was such an amazing experience. And also one thing about back then was commercials were shot for a longer period. So we shot this 30 second commercial over a week. Mm -hmm. So it was like a masterclass in acting on camera. Sure. And, and doing very filmic type of acting coming out of a very th theatrical background where you have to act for the cheap seats, you know? So th that, was, that was an amazing experience for me to get that first yes. Uh, I'll come back to the journey of the other yeses. I, mm -hmm. I deliberately want to come here to one of the things that have been a continuum, whether you like it or not, as we spoke about our private lives being yeah. displayed and being displayed in public. Um, do you think you know why you got divorced the first time? That's a good question. I think I have uh, a good idea, but I, I also, there are moments when I'm like, I have no freaking clue. You know what I mean? Um, like I said, I think as I get older, I, I know less, you know what I mean? Uh, mm -hmm. It's sort of like mm -hmm. when I was in my 20s, I wish I had written a book about every subject because I knew everything. Because I thought I did. Yeah. yeah. Right? I, I, I knew how to be a husband. <laughs> I knew how to be a father. Yeah. I could tell yeah. you how to start your business. Yeah, yeah. And I think what life teaches you through experience is there's certain aspects of things that, you, that are in your control and there's certain aspects of things that are just not in your control. And I could sit here and rap lyrical about hey young man you know when you first get married do this or that yeah there are certain basics of it that i think are important and you stick to that it, it'll probably work out but there are certain things that are just out of your control and when i think about my first marriage a lot of things uh there was so much that i felt wasn't in my control in fact i'd say every time i've been married i've realized that there's a lot that's not in your control you know and and as a young man i would always say to a young man you just do your part and do your best and let God handle the rest and hopefully it'll work out. But if it doesn't, find out where you went wrong because that's really more important than where the other person went wrong and try and be better next time. How does one deviate from what God wants from their marriage? And, and are there areas that you've identified you felt you deviated in that first marriage? I, I do think, here's, here's the thing about marriage, right? And this is something that I think we don't talk about enough especially in the modern world. Marriage is a biblical concept, mm. right? It's not, it's, as much as it's a societal kind of norm, it's a biblical concept. Now, you want to you wanna, you wanna try and make it work, you have to go back to what, the, what, do the, what does the book that invented this thing say about it? What are the principles in this what book? What are the principles in this book? And I think because us in television, we show you guys marriages like this, like that, like that, and a lot of it is very idealized. Hmm. So I think television, whether it's South Africa or Hollywood, has made marriage seem like it's just about two people and they live happily ever after. Mm -hmm. As long as they treat each other right and they like love each other, everything will work out. But things pop up, you know, real life pops up, work pops up, children pop up, um, family that you've now inherited inherited yeah, pops up yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the dynamics of these just two people who grew up in different homes sure i mean my siblings and i grew up in the same home and our idea on life is so different correct correct how much more two people who grew up in two different homes so i think the basics is and I, i'm going to be controversial about this but that's okay the bible says very very clearly men love your wife Women, submit to your husband. Now, we always have a problem with that in modern marriage because, one, what does love actually look like? What does loving a woman really look like? And for me, I would say loving a woman is, is a choice. It's every day choosing that this is the person I made vows to for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer. A lot of us stumble when we get to the for worse part when we get to for the poorer part, when we get to in sickness part, mm -hmm. because we, exp we, we only listen to for better, uh, for richer, in health, and in life. <laughs> and wealth. Yeah. And, and life doesn't work that way, man. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So a lot of people, I think, give up because what happens is they become very black and white. Like, you're a good person based on A, B, C, D. Now, when I see something that messes with that picture... 
I start going, I, I can't deal with this and I don't want to deal with this, as opposed to be very, get to a point where you're realistic about the person you're with and say, this is what's good about them. This is what's terrible about them because they're a human being. I have to love the person through what's terrible about them because it's easy to love someone the good side, right? That's, but that's not love. That's not biblical love because what is, like love is, you must love even the ones who treat you badly. Mm. And that's not always. Love it. your neighbor. Love your Who's neighbor. Who's treating you horribly. Yeah, you know? I mean, Jesus says love your enemy. Yeah, yeah. So I think a lot of the times we get married and then um, it gets a little bit, you know, shady here and there. There's like aspects you're like, but you, you, when we started out, you came across as this like attentive dude, you know, you were always taking me out for dinners and you had time for me and whatever. And now you're always at work or you're busy now. Maybe, you know, I didn't expect you to, to be as close as you are to your family. Cause it's, it's all about your family or, um, there's moment when you're moments when you're grumpy and all that we, we've got to take the full person. And I think modern marriage has made us people who, um, you know, like we change our cell phones every two years. Mm. In the old days, you just repair stuff. Mm. You don't change it. Mm -hmm. Now we just, well, I'll just get someone else. Was there a period after the marriage ended when the divorce papers were finally signed where you felt like I failed as a man? Oh, definitely. Um, from, from the period where I think even before we got divorced, where I was like, I'm dealing with this and I'm young and I'm not understanding it. And no one's really telling me the things that I'm saying now. You know what I mean? Um, I think sometimes we get very wishy-washy. Sometimes you go for counseling. And I always say about counseling, it's good to go to counseling. But counseling is like going to a nutritionist or personal trainer. There's a lot of work you have to do by yourself. Correct. I can tell you, hell, I know how to lose weight. But it's really hard, you know. Um, and that's where the magic happens when you're doing it on your own. So a lot of the times we're not willing to do that work on our own because mm. it is hard. Mm. But if you push through the hard, things start getting easier. It's like lifting weights. Your f the first time you do uh, a chest press, you know, with a 20, uh, 20 kilogram, I suppose, dumbbell, you know, on each arm, it's heavy. But after a while, it's not that heavy. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. after a while you start looking forward to going to the gym and going, yo, today I want to even challenge myself. I want to push myself to maybe get to 40 or whatever. I think we, we, we forget that marriage is like anything else that you do well. You, as a, as, as a guy who's, who's, you're an engineer. Yes, I'm an engineer. You know that with engineering, there's certain things about it that you start to enjoy the challenge mm -hmm. of how do I make the structure strong? Sure, sure, sure. Um, using these engineering principles and knowing that what I came in as my preconceptions might not be what really is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Like stress factor. In I fact, that's you. what I'd say. You. Engineer, yeah, you know what yeah, you, do? Yeah, you yeah. do? You put things under stress. Yeah, yeah. And to, you test. <laughs> to test. How far can they withstand the stress? All right? Yeah. And that's what marriage is, a continual... Stress factor test. So, <laughs> um, you're in your 30s. You feel like you failed as a man. Um, you try and do the work to, to repair um, what you felt you did wrong. Um, why try again and get married again? That's a good question. Everyone says I'm crazy for, for doing <laughs> it so often, right? But um, I really believe in the concept of love. And I really believe that as human beings we are supposed to find that special someone and grow with that person and heal each other mm -hmm. through a committed, loving relationship. Because okay. you can't do that, really. You can't heal each other as something that's not committed. Like, a as soon as there's that chance that this is not committed, someone could walk out, then the healing can never happen. Okay. And I think if we took it like that, like, we're supposed to heal each other and in so doing heal our families and in so doing heal our communities and in so doing heal our society and in so doing heal our country. We'll look at marriage as a very different proposition. Um, I was quite sad when Sia and Rachel announced that they're getting divorced. Um, I was sad for them. I was sad for their children. And I was sad for the nation as a whole because we looked up to them. And now our ideas of you know, they're probably people who are like, I'm just hanging in this marriage. Mm. 
And when you go, well, I'm getting a divorce, and people see that, they, they sometimes also go, maybe it's not such a bad idea. You know, so, if you're so, unhappy, so. just get out. And of course, there's certain parameters. I'm not going to say if someone's abusing you or, or, or being unfaithful, you should stick around. But I sometimes think we, we break up for, especially we break up marriages for much, much less reasons. The, the modern marriages, I mean, you echoed this earlier that modern marriages, it feels like a person is, indis- is dispensable. Like you can dispense a human being. Yeah, dispense a human being. And, and you know, in Zulu, they're the saying, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and we are a very, we have a throwaway culture. Hmm. Um, and I also think it's because we, we, everything is cheap now. You know, mm. nothing, nothing seems even to have a wife. <laughs> even a wife or a husband is yeah. cheap. Like, yeah. I'll just get another one, right? Yeah. I'll just get another yeah. man. There's, you know, you hear this often. There's many men out mm. there, mm. you know, mm. who want me and who've got money. Or I'll just get another beautiful woman, mm. you know. I'll get a baddie. I'll get a baddie. <laughs> <laughs> <I'll get> a... <laughs> you can't turn a baddie into a, a wife. Into no? a wife yeah. I think we've seen it quite a few times that yeah. birdies who tried to be wives, they've, they've come back to the streets. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, but your second marriage wasn't glorious. With, no, with how it actually it, got worse. With how it played out. Yeah. Um, that's why I want to ask again, why go down that route all over again? Um, I think I had, I had big plans of doing something bigger than myself, you know? Um, I think that that's what marriage is, is for a man. You're living for for someone greater than yourself. And I think being in this industry, it's so easy to be all about you. You know, I'm the big celebrity. I'm making moves. I'm doing this and that. Um, as my as my nephew has told me, he says, I got motions, twin. You know, as opposed to I'm doing something that that is bigger than myself. There's there's a there's another person, and there's a, there's there's our families that are involved in this. And that was my dream, you know. And now, in hindsight, when I look at it, I think that there was a lot of healing that could have taken place for my ex, had she stuck around, and there could have been a lot of healing for me had I also. I don't know if I could have fought harder. To be honest, I stuck it out as as long as I possibly could. But sometimes things don't work out the way you want them to. You know? How long was the marriage? It was around about five years. Five years. That's long. That's long. That's... We'd known each other for eight. Um, so it was a long time. And you, mm-hmm. you build so much, you know, you put so much. And I always say, like, sometimes it's just easier to, to carry on, to keep trying to, to try and work this thing out because you can. And I, and I think my parents have shown me that. They've been together for 50 years now. And I don't think it was always easy. But their uh, basis of why they got into it was not, I'm looking to get married to make my life easier. I'm looking to get married to serve. I think I, I see that with them. Like, they served each other so much. Yeah, yeah. My yeah. father put my mother through med school at a time when it was so difficult. He literally married a woman and then had to let her go for six years and let her go be in university mm-hmm. far, far away and be a university student. I mean, that's absolute madness. Correct, because we believe in, now you must be around me, you must be around me. Yeah. But your father was like, go be yourself. Yeah. I'm here. And I'll, I'll accept that here, it will be here from a distance for now, but there's a greater purpose, which is for your growth. Yeah, and my mother under, understood this, the assignment. Yeah. You know, she went to varsity, she didn't fool around. She made sure that um, she, she passed and got through what she needed to do in, in the time allotted. And I was born by that stage, by yeah, the way. Yeah, so I was yeah. like this kid who was going, you know, living with my uncles and aunts. And, and so when, when she comes out of med school, now she becomes a doctor. Although my dad was kind, was like, he was a teacher for, for a large part of that period, and then he went into corporate. He was starting, like, at the bottom. So here's this woman who's come out of med school, and, sh- and she's up here, yeah, earning more yeah. money than him. Yeah, and there yeah. was never that sense of, well, I'm the boss now. You Correct. Know? I'm, what, what, are the, what, are the, what are the girls like to call? I'm the boss lady. Boss babe. Boss babe. <laughs> yeah. uh, you can't tell me what to do. Sure. There was a lot of respect between the two of them. Hmm. And they, they wanted to build something, and they did. They did such a good job of it. And that's just what I, what I wanted to emulate. I'll compare that success that your mother got that platformed her life as a doctor to you being a celebrity. Um, do you think being a celebrity contributed to the demise of your marriages? I don't know. 
uh, if it was the cause, but it certainly would have a contribution. It's okay. very difficult. I mean, I've signed up for this, right? I, I'm in it. I know how it works. Um, and with my first wife, I'd say I was kind of on the come up. So it's sort of like, when we start dating, I'm this guy with big dreams. I'm going somewhere. She sees that. And then by the time we're married, I'm like this guy. Yeah. Yeah. On yeah, yeah. Everybody knows me everywhere we go. Sure. And it's a lot of pressure, you know, and I don't know if she signed up. She really understood. Um, and it was, I think, probably very hard on her. And you need someone who is very secure in themselves because hmm. I'm a young man. You know, at that point in my career, I was the leading man. I am the love interest. Mm -hmm. So I'm going from show to show being someone's boyfriend. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. And I have to play it so convincingly that when you watch it, you're like, this guy's <laughs> in life. Yeah. But I understand what I'm doing. Mm. And I think it was very difficult for her. Second marriage, I also think there, once again, I was coming off the back end of, of that divorce and... It seemed like, although I was established, I think she quite didn't get it. You know, I remember her appearing in a magazine for the first time and just going, oh, my gosh, my family back home in the Eastern Cape has seen this. And we're together on the cover of You magazine and Drum magazine and Ace Canwood. And you haven't even lobolled me and they're losing their mind. And I'm like, it's OK. You know, um, this is your life now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you kind of just step into this. And then there's a lot of pressure that also comes with it, you know, because you have your own identity as a woman and as a young woman trying to find yourself as well. And now there's this identity that's foisted on you. You are this guy's wife. And you can overcome that, you know. You can be yourself, but you have to understand where you are in that moment and understand that this is also a life you chose by choosing this dude. And I think that was quite difficult. That was quite difficult for her. How do we go from this beautiful love story with your, your second wife to I don't want you to ever see your daughter again? Wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question. It really is. Um, these are tough questions, but I think they're good because I think people need to understand this. And I think that's something that's happening at the moment in our society. Okay. Where we weaponize certain things. I think certain things like GBV have become weaponized. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a young man, especially a young black man, being alleged to have done something immediately stops everything that, that has to happen, right? Livelihood gone. Gone. Cancelled. Gone. If, if, if I said to you, or if this happened to you, I'm going to give a, a real example that's happening, it's playing out. The Senzo may be a case. Yes. Right now. Yes. The Senzo was killed. Mm -hmm. You don't know how. Mm -hmm. But there is talk. Mm -hmm. And the state is thinking of charging Kelly Kumal. Yeah. The, the state has said this mm -hmm. for the murder of Senzo Mayu. Sure. Kelly still gets gigs. Kelly still got a billboard. Kelly still getting endorsements. TV shows. TV shows. It's happening because there's the, we presume you innocent until proven guilty. Mm. Turn that around. Senzo is the one who is alleged that maybe he had some involvement, I can tell you now Senzo would be cancelled. Senzo would not be getting TV shows and that sort of thing. So we weaponize this thing so much that it's become a tool that we use in everyday life. Like even like you can't see your daughter now. So our system of justice is at a point where I'll talk about parenting. Mothers and fathers have equal rights to parent a child in equal responsibilities. Okay. Except fathers have to go prove those rights in a court of law. Huh. And I deal with a lot of fathers that are going through what I went through, but I stuck it out and went through it. And I, and I counsel them and I help them and I, I just talk to them. And I'm finding that the biggest thing about something like that is women understand that if they're angry enough at you and they know that you love your children and you want to be with them, they can use that as a tool and as a weapon when you now like like it's over between us. I, I don't owe you anything. I just want to come see the kids. But to keep hurting your feelings because I'm going through some hurt, then I'm going to deny you seeing these kids. But what they forget 
is the kids don't care about all that. They just want to see their dad. And it's important for kids to have a good relationship with their dad. Otherwise, the cycle perpetuates. Mm -hmm. So I find that a lot of the times we have people who get married, and, and I'll say young women who come from broken homes that don't have a relationship with their own father, and they take it for granted that the reason why they go, they're going through some of the challenges that they're going through is because of daddy issues. But now they're going to perpetuate that with their own children. Hmm. And it's up to them to stop it there. To, to stop the cycle stop or, or the, cycle. The, the curse. The for curse. Of a yeah, the generational word. curse. Um, for clarity, there no. wasn't violence in your marriage. No. What but there was allegations of violence. When you wake up, I, I wanted to go there. When you wake up and you see front page that you're supposedly a violent man. Like, what's the first reaction that you have? Um, who do you call? I just want to imagine, um, I've never been violent in my life. I, I can barely even raise my voice. And I can imagine how much it would break me for someone whom I love dearly. Because even when you break up with someone, you still love them. Hmm. To go and tell people, especially yeah. in, in a brand that I've built, and tell the media that I've been violent. Like, what did it do hmm. to you? It, it hurt a lot. I think also, the one thing for me, is there had been a lot of tension for a long time and it just kept building and building and building. And by the time it broke and the first confrontation was, we, I've gotten to a point now where I'm like, I'm not able to deal with our marriage the way it is. And one thing that I think is a, con a major contributing factor is the fact that we now are living in a situation where there's three of us. There's me, there's you, there's your mother who lives with us, who's literally sleeping in my, in my bed with you. I would like us to have some space. She needs to go. And now this is building. And it gets to that confrontational phase. And we have a confrontation. And there was, I, I kind of think it, it was building up, you know, because there had been uh, the week before she went and called the cops because we had a confrontation. And I was like, this is crazy, you know. I explained to the cops, they left. This time, she starts recording, you know, voice recording. I'm like, do the video. And I, and I get absolutely angry. Take the phone, smash it. I leave. And then I'm like, oh, shit, I did such a terrible. Hmm. I'm sorry, I'll get you another phone. Hmm. But I've got things to go to. It's a normal working day. I come back home, and damn, as soon as I arrive, not even 10 minutes later, the police come. They're like, Mr. Masha, there's a protection order. You have to leave the house. So I'm like, wow, okay. Uh, can I have a moment to use the bathroom? Mm. They're like, we'll wait for you. Literally, they're waiting outside my bathroom door. I leave, and now I'm like, okay, there's a protection order. This is bad. Let's see where it goes. I think everything just happened really fast. But it had been, because that was like a Wednesday. The following Saturday, I am like, dear Maga, you know, I'm not dealing very well with this. I'm at my parents' house at this point. That night, it was a Friday night. I went out with some friends. We had a jaw. We had a good time. Wake up in the morning, decide, ah, let me just go to the Woolies, you know, pick up some, some stuff, some groceries, make breakfast or whatever. As I'm approaching the till, it was at the time, I think they still have them, like newspapers, but it was yeah. like the Saturday Star. And I'm like, I'm on the front cover. And it says, Masha bash me. And it's our picture that we took at a function. And it's got that thing. You that know? red that, that, break thing. Yeah, yeah. That, like the picture's yeah. torn. Like, it's just crazy. And I'm still approaching the till, you know. And I'm now like, you're like, is everybody looking at yeah. me? <laughs> so I pick up the newspaper because I, like, I also want to read because I'm curious. So I pick up the newspaper and I slap it down. And the cashier, you know, she looks down. She looks at me. She looks down. She just does the thing. And that's when it hit me. Yeah. Like, I'm public news now. So this is now something that cannot be fixed internally. It's mm. now out of our control. And I knew from that, I kind of knew from the moment I got the protection order to, to, to leave my house that things are not going to be the same. But I still had hope that maybe we can talk about it. We can, because we had even had like parents coming over. My parents had said, listen to her mom, we, we, like give the kids some space let's let's as parents try and like rather support them as opposed to taking sides and all that but i thought maybe even after that it can work but once it was public it was like now it's out of my control there's nothing more i can do and that's when i knew that 
it was basically over. So that was quite a shock to me. Do you think you know what influenced her to take that route? I have my I have my ideas, and you know I haven't. Really, this is the first time I'm actually speaking about it like this. So you're very lucky that you got <laughs> thank this, you <laughs> got me to open up like this because I I also I've been very careful to make sure that in everything that I say about this, I am not trying to either come across as a victim, one. Or retaliate. Or retaliate. Yeah, and be like, yeah, actually, th- yeah, th- this is yeah. what she did. Because yeah. I think, one, I-, I think that's, in the long term, that's not a good thing. My child, I want my daughter to watch this one. Sure, sure. And, and not be re-traumatized by what her parents went through. Mm-hmm. And, and look at her father and go, in that moment, I wish she had protected my mother. Because she's still a person. Absolutely. In spite of how I might feel about what she did to me, she's still a person. She's still a good person. Mm-hmm. She might have been at that time maybe a person who reacted overly emotional. I do think that she got counsel from people who were like, we're going to do a PR campaign. We're going to destroy this guy. We're going to do A, B, C, and D. And I think at the time it kind of worked, you know. But here's the thing about, about life. If you didn't make somebody, you can't break somebody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and although, as the saying goes, by the time a lie has gone out and spread, the, the truth hasn't even gotten out of bed. Mm-hmm. Eventually, the truth does come out, you know, and everything plays out for itself. I always say I was lucky, actually, that at the time there was, like, I say uh, the NPA and the police were so gung-ho about this whole GBV thing that I actually got a moment in court, you know, because then... All of those allegations could be ventilated in a court of and tested and tested. Yeah. People could tell their story, whereas a lot of other people don't even get that opportunity. It just ends up as a stain in your life, as an allegation, but we never know what really happened. So, um, for me, I I see it as also it was a good thing because of what I've learned over the years and how much stronger I am as a person and how much I can support other people. You know, and I can help many, many other people who are going through what I've gone through. In closing this topic, how much did you lose? Everything. No ways. Everything. Um, when I say I lost everything, it's like I lost everything and more. You know, I lost my house. I lost work. Um, even just as a voice artist, people were like, we're just like, we don't know if we can work with Tamisha anymore because... Huh. You know, these allegations. Yeah, it's always yeah. like until he's cleared mm. and he can come back. And, I, and that's why I say I thank God that I went through the court process. Because even though, it, you know, nobody, there was no front page of Dimitri Masha not found guilty. Um, and here's what was said in court. There wasn't that. There was no apology. There was no redaction. Uh, if you're lucky, you get something in the back mm, somewhere mm, where mm. people won't even say without a picture that says, oh, he, the, the, the dude wasn't found guilty. And it's sometimes written in such a way that, you know, he just had better lawyers mm, or whatever. Mm. Um, I think people don't understand that in, I think in instances where someone definitely is found guilty of doing something heinous, yes, he shouldn't have, or she, or she, also remember that, mm-hmm shouldn't have a right to represent us in society. But we, we have to get to a point where we're like, how do we make this thing work? Because part of that is the abuse of it is you're trying to defend yourself, but to defend yourself in a court of law, you need lawyers and lawyers need to get paid. Mm-hmm. But now you have no means of income. So the chances of you actually being able to, to mount a successful defense are diminished by the fact that you have no means, no means yeah. to even defend yourself. So sure. you just you just do what you can, you know. Um, and that's the other part because the other part is there was a bigger picture at play that that at first I didn't actually see, and much of that that came through was listen if if you pay my client this money or if you give her the house and if you do this we can make all this go away. It's a pair, and I was like. I'm not going to do that. And what happened, what, and what usually happens, I always say, when you get divorced, 
just try and break up amicably, amicably because the, the only people who win are the lawyers. Mm -hmm. In the end, she had huge legal bills. I had huge legal bills. So not only do you lose what you have, you're paying people on top of that, all this money to just literally keep something that could have gone from here to there in a very short space of time, just going around and around. Mm -hmm. These lawyers literally talk to each other. Mm -hmm. They're like, hey, listen, tomorrow, let's just postpone. Um, we're not really ready. Cool, that's not a problem. We're going to charge them anyway. Let's just pitch up, say we're postponing. You still get charged for the full day. And you do that enough times. You know, a lot of the times you go, let's say if you go into the high court, that appearance that your lawyer is making every day is anywhere between 20 grand because you're paying an attorney and an advocate, an advocate. And they have to file affidavits and all sorts of things. It's any, that just that day is anywhere between 20 and 50, maybe even more, 1,000 rands a day. So if you do that in a year 10 times, that's a half a million. And that's very easy. Losing everything, the money, the houses, but still remaining famous, but going into living with your parents again. What does a season of isolation like this, like that that you are forced into but didn't choose yeah. do to you? I think at first you go through all the stages of grief, denial, I don't want to be here, uh, acceptance, I am here, mourning, this is horrible to acceptance to like, okay, this is my life and I'm going to find joy in it again. And for me, what I really am very grateful for is that period helped me to live with my parents as a grown-up. I get you. So I got to know them as people as opposed to my Peers, dad. probably. Peers, right? Yeah. And I got so much more. I grew up in that place. I just got so much more insight into how to do life that I didn't get. I'd been separated from my parents for a long time because I was out here in Joburg doing my thing, you know. And I learned once again how much my family loves me. Not for who I am as a star, but just who I am as a person. They just love you. They just love me, man. Mm. And that changed my outlook on the business. I was like, actually, now I'm going to do this different. I'm just going to be there. It's either you love me or you leave me alone. And it's so freeing. Yeah, and I'll yeah, say that yeah. to young people who are out there now, like you're making it and you're doing so well and you're under so much pressure and you're thinking, I have to always... Um, have an announcement of something big that I've done. Or, or you know, have a song and dance and appear yeah. as this. Yeah, yeah. And just to be like, yo, just be yourself, man. And, and just be okay with the fact that this is your work, but it's not a who you are. The identity politics between understanding the work and, and, and who you are. Yeah. What has been your most challenging role? Being a father. <laughs> <laughs> acting. Screen, acting wise. Um, I think up to date was, being, was doing fences. That was really, really challenging. Mm -hmm. And challenging for the fact that, you know, Dr. John Ghani was supposed to play the leading role literally up until... I think it was two weeks before we went on stage that he just had to pull out because of his health. Mm -hmm. And then I'm brought in. I was playing another part, and now I have to, like, step up. I have to learn all these lines in a matter of days that, that should take at least a month or two. Okay. Um, and then also act, and it's stage. So there's no, sorry, Retake. guys. Retake. <laughs> can, can we do that again? Yeah. It's like, this is it. Yeah. And I remember... I had accepted the role. It's, it was four days in. And I'm on page 10. I'm still struggling to learn up to page 10. And there's another 73 pages of dialogue and mostly monologues. Mm. And I was in my shower and I just started crying. I was like, God, is this how I go out? I'm just going to go out on stage. <laughs> I'm going to say these first 10 lines. Then I want to dry up, look at everybody and say, thank you for coming, everyone. Good night. And that's the end of my career. <laughs> I was like, is this some sort of a setup? Yeah, yeah. And I prayed hard about it, you know. And something happened, like there was a switch. And I tell you, we were opening on Thursday night because it was like, a, I'd say like a, a pre-opening opening. opening. <laughs> Wednesday night. I was on that stage and the, the, the assistant director was still prompting me. I'd, I'd like get stuck. Uh, and then what do I say? 
And I was like, I'm going to have to do something. I'm maybe going to have to put an earphone in my ear and then I'm going to have to come up with a code that when I do this, she must just whisper something. I went home that night, went over my script again, went over my script again. Thursday night wasn't too bad. Friday is the grand opening. Press, everyone is there. Just came out. Was a miracle. Yeah. Literally yeah. a miracle. Never looked back. You, you just remembered everything. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been in a role and you felt like, I wish I could resign, but it will disappoint too many people. Too many eggs will oh, fall yeah. apart. Yeah. This is yeah. feeling monotonous. I'm feeling tired of doing this. Yeah. And are you able to say which role that was? My first major starring role in a TV show was for SABC2. It was this show, I can't remember, it was called Brothers. And I was just like, I was a kid, I'm desperate to get this role because it's a starring role, mm -hmm. you know, it's a TV series, it's a big deal. And I get the role, we have our first meet up and read through whatever. And we're starting to shoot on Monday, it's Friday. There's 13 episodes like this thick. They're written in English. And at the read-through, I'm like, some of it will be in English, you know, I'm just reading some of mm. it in Zwana, and they come and tell me, actually, it's all got to be in Setswana. And uh, you have to translate it and learn the lines. And obviously, we're shooting out a sequence because we're shooting a drama series. So I've got from Friday till Monday to translate an entire 13 episodes and learn it because I can't come on set and still be like, I don't know mm. my lines. And I realized I'm overwhelmed. I'm, I can't do this. And I wanted to quit. I really just wanted to quit. Um, I got to work and I was like, I want out. But I couldn't say it because I was like, one, there are people counting on me. My agent is counting on me. Um, this production is counting on me. It's it's late for them now to recast. That means they're going to lose a week. Mm, mm. The channel is counting on me. I just have to do what I have to do, you know, and it was really tough. We had an incredibly inexperienced director. He had been someone who was more like a floor manager or a mm. first AD, but had never directed anything himself in his life. He didn't have a lot of support from a budget point of view. There wasn't any wiggle room for, for time and space. He was a Zulu-speaking man who could hardly even speak Setswana. The continuity lady was Afrikaans, not even <laughs> Motswana. Everything was a mess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we somehow got through this. And I remember one prominent agent at the time coming and, and telling, I don't, I don't know if they told me or they told someone else, that it was the biggest mistake of my life and I'd probably never work in this town again because the show was so terrible. And I was down, man. I was, I was so, I was sad. I wouldn't say I was depressed. I don't get depressed, but I was just sad for a while, you know? Because I was like, so I started and I'll, that was, I was one, not even a hit, one hit, one down. Yeah. Just a one, one. <laughs> one, one. Because it's not a hit. <laughs> it's not a hit. <laughs> um. You've gone on to do many, many films. You've gone on to do many series, drama series, soapies. Uh, you've gone the whole route. Telenovela currently. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you presented. Finished. I was one of presented. the first presenters on Channel O, by the way. Remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, does the industry, has it improved in, 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 in its wholeness with the treatment of black young creatives? I think it's gotten worse. Ish. And what makes me really sad is it was better when the industry overseers were white. Huh. And I've got to say that. I've got to challenge the black people who work in the broadcast channels, um, who work on the streaming services. And I have to say to them that when they took over, things got worse. Hmm. Things like, they don't need, we don't need to, you know, they don't need that much money hmm. to make this thing happen. Um, we don't need to pay these young people as much as we used to. Because, you know, they're black. Mm. It wasn't white people who were saying that. It was black people. Um, we don't need to make television shows that challenge our audience mentally. Mm. We don't need to make television shows that 
are uplifting to black people, that show successful black families, that show successful black men and women. Um, we've got a lot of trash on our TV shows, you know. Uh, I'll even put it, Gaspitori, the promoter of It's not white people who are doing that. It's young black executives. Eroding our cultures, our morals. Eroding our cultures, our, our morals. Yeah. Um, what people don't understand is, is entertainment is very insidious. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Bible says, guard your hearts, because from it comes all the things of this world, right? And what that means is, how do I get into your heart through your ears and your eyes? Mm. You just have to have the TV on. You can be having a conversation, doing whatever, but that TV being on and your, you and your kids sitting around, I mean, how many shows nowadays are family shows? Mm -mm. We, What's that? <laughs> we could watch Isi Dingo with grandpa, grandma, Correct. mom, dad, the kids, Correct. enjoy it, and we, there'd be a lesson on family, on, on being honest, don't steal, don't do this. Now you can't watch anything. You watch something. I can't watch anything with my nine-year-old. Mm -hmm. We're busy watching something, and then suddenly, boom, nudity. Mm. Um, soft porn, by the soft way. Not porn, nudity. Not even Huge nudity, di right? difference, yeah. What, what is she learning from these young black women that are on screen or these older black women that are on screen? What is she getting into her mind about being a teenager that she's seeing there? And all of it is trash. So we end up having to watch international stuff. And so when people say, why do your kids not speak um, a local language? Well, the way to learn, the, one of the best ways to learn mm. all languages is to just watch it on TV. Mm. So I have to like um, really be very careful. I have to cherry pick what she, watch, what she watches, right? And, and a lot of it is I have to now go on this side. You can watch this. Go on that side. You can watch this. And it's all from America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's that one thing you know for sure? But you're absolutely certain of um, and you believe in? I believe that God really exists and he loves us very much and he wants the best for us, even when we're going through tough times hmm. and even when things are looking bad. Even then, I believe very strongly in God's love and that he's working things out for our good constantly. Mr. Timisho Masha, this platform aims to facilitate growth conversations and we thank you so much for as you said sharing something that is very private and dear to you um i know that uh, some will try and use it for nefarious reasons that you've shared this mm. but i really hope that at the core of it people see the growth and the importance of the conversation that we had thank you so much for being a living legend uh we just want to give you your your, your recognition and your flowers you. because even when when you're late one day this will live forever on the internet and people will know how much you've done. They'll get to research what you've done and see that everything that you've been doing is just trying your best. So thank you so much. Thank you for that to opportunity to, yeah. to talk to people, yeah. you know, and also show them that there's more to people than just being this living legend or this big celebrity. At, at the core of it, I think we're all just human beings trying to make it in the world. And some of us have been given a platform to speak to many people. And it's about how do we use that platform to enrich the lives of others and to uplift them and inspire. Mr. Tumisho Masha taught me that life is gray. It's either sometimes dark gray or sometimes it's light gray. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you guys on the next episode. Introducing the epitome of luxury living. Galu Luxury Villas and Suites, your private sanctuary of opulence and elegance. Nestled amongst the lush, sun-kissed landscapes of Durban, KwaZulu-Natal, this Galu Luxury Villa is a paradise of tranquility, offering breathtaking panoramic views of the neighborhood. Step into a world of refined luxury where every detail has been meticulously crafted to create an atmosphere of sophistication and comfort. 
this villa is kept within a gated and secure property for your peace of mind. The Kalu Villa is available for both short-term and long-term stays, making it the ideal location for your next vacation or special event. This villa boasts spacious living areas and floor to ceiling windows that flood the interior with natural light, making you feel at one with the surrounding beauty paired with multiple terraces, an outdoor lounge and a dining area. Live the dream, make memories and indulge in the life you deserve. Contact us today to book your stay or to learn more about this exquisite property. Your oasis of opulence awaits.